Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. Stop, don't look at that yet. <laughs> uh, I've been sitting here prepping everything. And uh, I hit the start of the live stream and there's no audio for the intro. I was like, really? So I fixed that. And then we come to my scene and here I am with a little thing you're not supposed to see yet. So hopefully you blinked and missed it or you weren't looking because you were thinking he's late anyway. Anyway, I'm Mark Levinson of Me Loves Reef. Uh, look, Love Reef, I've worn this shirt in forever. <laughs> and uh, today's topic is going to be about talking about filtration. And specifically, I'm not, I'm actually wanting to interact with you on this topic because I'm working on a big project. And uh, that would be, <laughs> you probably guessed it already, working on Coral Magazine. So, uh, as you guys know, I am, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where did it go? Where did it go? I am the executive editor of Coral Magazine, and this is the current issue, which is the January-February issue. However, we are working on the March-April one now. Do you guys want to see a teaser? I mean, you know, should I should I let you get a peek at the cover? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, if you're not a subscriber, <clears throat> you go to coralmagazine.com slash milev23. Uh, we really should change that to milev24, to be honest, because it is 2024. But if you go there... You can get it with a discount for a one-year subscription. And I really am determined to get every single one of you viewers, you know, like right now we have 35 people on here because we just started. I want 35 subscriptions <laughs> because everyone should be reading this magazine. I mean, forget the 2,000 hours that goes into making a copy. I just feel like you're going to benefit so much for the price of half a frag. I mean, it's $37 and, you know, like thirty-seven oh six or something for six issues, which is cheap. Uh, so anyway, I am um, going to continue to encourage you to get that subscription because I feel like it's really, really important. Um, so I'll show you the teaser. Okay, you guys ready? I'm only going to put it up there for a minute. <laughs> so that is our filtration issue that we're working on. And the reason we're going to talk about that today is because I was kind of wanting to hear about your filtration in case I want to use some of what you talk about in the next article we're working on. Because it's going to be a series of articles, but we have one we're actually building ourselves. Um, and uh, I wanted to have a conversation. So we're going to do that today. We're not just going to talk about We're going to discuss it and uh, might be using some of your insights in... As you're reading the magazine, you're like, oh, I actually mentioned this. How cool is that? So I want you guys to uh, do me a favor and, you know, chat, uh, comment in the chat. And I also want you to, uh, you know, if you're after this live stream is over, if you're watching the video later, you know, reply to this video in the comments below because um, I'd love your feedback. So filtration is when, I mean, how do you even feel about filtration? Do you feel like it's important or you're thinking, eh, it's the least I care about. As long as I do water changes, I don't need filters. I mean, where do you stand? Is there any piece of equipment that you think you cannot, absolutely not, live without? As you guys know, mine is the protein skimmer. I feel like it's absolutely critical to the reef tank. But uh, I want to know what you think. And all of you with all-in-one systems, are you happy with the filtration that's included? Or do you always, or do you modify it? Do you, I was going to say always modify it because I'm assuming you're getting so many tanks. But, you know, if you have a tank, do you sit there and say, I can work with what they gave me? Are you trying to enhance it? Are you trying to upgrade it? Are you trying to eliminate parts of it because you think it's dumb? You know, I really would love to hear some of your thoughts. How many of you are using a canister filter? How many of you are using hang on back filters? Or are you all converted to sumps because I highly recommend them? You know, these are some of the things I'm wondering. If you have a fish only system, what is the filtration you use on fish only? I'm really curious. I actually have a phone call planned later on today with Ben Johnson to talk about this because he couldn't just answer my reply in a chat. He said, oh, there's so much to talk about. And I was like, all right, all right. But uh, I want to know about those fish only systems because I've never kept one. I always have a reef, you know, some kind of a reef, some version of a reef. <laughs> so I'm big on all the stuff. But uh, yeah. And um, but before I continue, I want to tell you guys a little story and that'll give you kind of time to type, you know, what it is, your, your comments in here, because I want to I want to interact with the chat today more than just talk to the camera nonstop for, you know, 30, 45 minutes. So I told Matt 
Matt Peterson of Coral Magazine, I need a mug because when I'm, you know, drinking my coffee here you know, during the show, I wanted to say Coral, you know? Might as well take a sip while it's still slightly warm. <laughs> but uh, he says, no, Mark, we print magazines. We don't print mugs. And I was like, oh, come on. I need one freaking mug. Just give me one mug that I can put on this show. And he told me, hmm. So, of course, I don't like to take no for an answer, and I, I, I won't let it go. And I'm thinking, well, how do I get my hands on this mug? And uh, then what do I even want on the mug? I mean, I know what I want. I want the word coral to show up. Just like I want a t-shirt that says coral across the front, right? I mean, I just love this magazine so much. And now it's an important part of my life, so I love it even more. <laughs> and I want all of you to love it. So I start thinking, okay, well, if I had a coffee cup and I could put anything on it that I wanted, what if I could put on the front, the one of the parts that faces me, if it could be the first issue of the magazine I built, you know, so mine was two issues ago. I'm literally working on number three. So it's all very fresh in my mind. And I was like, the modern aquaculture two uh, magazine could be on the front. And then on the back could be the logo. So I see my cover and you see the logo. And, um, and then I thought, hmm, what can I put around the logo? And yeah, it was just, you know, spitballing ideas. But then I was, you know, I was like, okay, just coral. That's fine. I'm just trying to send a message. And then it occurred to me, what if I could put something on the bottom of the mug? And I immediately knew what I wanted. And I just thought, that is hilarious. So I called up Matt and I said, Matt, I got an idea. I said, I want to do the mug. And I want to, you know, do the cover here. I want to put the logo on the back. And I want to put the advertiser that's on the back cover of every issue of Coral Magazine, which is Tropic Marin. I said, I want to put them on the bottom of the mug. He's like, what? I was like, so when you take a sip, whoever is across from you will see Tropic Marin. It's just like when you're reading the magazine and you're holding it up and you're reading it, they see Tropic Marin. And he just burst out laughing. He says, that's hilarious. So then I was on a mission. I said, I've got to find someone that's willing to print the bottom of a mug. So I contacted my normal mug people and said, can you do this? And they said, no, absolutely not. So I contacted another company. No. Contact another one. No, we can't print the bottom of the mug. So I um, put a post on Facebook and said, does anyone know anyone that can help me print to the bottom of a mug? Because <laughs> I had this crazy idea. And uh, Michael Vargas, who does beautiful photography for the magazine, said, my brother can do this. And I was like, okay, great. That's fantastic. I love it. Does he have a blank mug with no writing on the bottom? It needs to be a naked cup. And he's like, yeah, let me check. And he says, yeah, they have nothing on the bottom. It doesn't say made in China or made in uh, you know, Paraguay or whatever. It just literally is a white mug. It's like, okay, cool. A white mug. Got, got it. And uh, so then I go back to Matt. I said, okay, Matt, I, I've got a guy that can do it. And uh, I just need you to make me a piece of art that, you know, because he they gave us dimensions. It needs to be eight inches long, three and a half inches tall, uh, that. And so, of course, I tell Matt that. And a month later, he finally makes my artwork. <laughs> so I wanted to unveil to you guys my new mug. So here it is. And this actually is a picture of a coral in my tank, by the way, because <laughs> I needed some background. So it says coral. And then on the other side is my first issue of the magazine, which you can see. And then when I take my sip, wait for it. What do you think of that? Isn't that cool? It's awesome. I love it. It makes me laugh every time I see it. And you know what? I actually see it more often than you think. You would think you put it on the table, it's gone, it's invisible, no one knows. But when I have to wash it and put it in the dryer rack by my sink, what do I see? Tropic Marin. And if some of you are like, what is he talking about? Because I don't get Coral Magazine. Here's Coral Magazine. Here's Tropic Marin on the back. Every single issue is Tropic Marin on the back. So I um, sent a couple of these to Lou and Leslie Eckes at Tropic Marin. And they loved it. And Leslie wrote me an email and she says, I, am, I, I keep accidentally knocking them over and spilling liquid everywhere which made me burst out laughing because I know what she was doing. She goes, so I can see the logo on the bottom. 
<laughs> so I printed a total of a dozen of these. And I gave one to everyone in the staff at Coral as a gift for the end of the year and for putting up with a new guy. And uh, I just wanted everyone to have a nice coffee cup when they're working on the magazine. So I did more than that. You know, I told you about the logo. But down here in the bottom that you can barely see, I actually had to do something more because I, I, I'm never enough. I always need a little extra. So initially I was going to put Coral in the center of the cup, you know, just in the middle. And then I was going to put everyone's initials that works on the magazine like a like a cloud of like signing up you know everyone signs a birthday card that kind of thing I thought I'll just put everyone's initials scattered around it and I told Matt what I wanted and of course he did not do what I wanted <laughs> he kind of put them straight and I was like no I want them scattered like confetti and he was like oh, I can't do that and I was like yeah you totally can you make each one a separate little mask and then you pivot it and you do <laughs> I was asking for all this extra work for something absolutely insane that only 12 people are going to see. And then I was like, you know what? I got a much better idea. So I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to tell you a little secret about how we make the magazine that only we know. And I'm going to reveal the secret and I don't think I'm going to get fired for it. <laughs> if Matt's watching, I'm sure he's like, what? But he's not watching. He's probably doing something else. So anyway, when we get a file, a document, something, you know, an article, it comes usually in a, uh, a Word doc. And so there's this file name. And it could be like C21.1 uh, Simple Filtration Dash English. <laughs> uh, and then dot PDF. And then when I read it, I rename that file, everything you just heard, but I put a dash ML. And I, I upload it to the folder where we all can see it. And then the next person that reads it, reviews it, looks for errors and typos and all that, they will then put their initials and it'll be AL. And then, you know, we, you know, I get a hold of Amanda and I say, hey, I, you haven't looked at this file yet. I can tell because your initials are not on it. She goes through it, finds all the mistakes, and then it becomes this longer and longer and longer file name. It's, it's hilarious. It's ridiculous because when I need to look at these files, as I'm preparing the, the article for the magazine, my finder, because I use an, a Mac, my finder is like this wide. I always have to drag it open to see the whole file name. Every single, I mean, 400 times a day, I'm like dragging it wide because the default always wants to show me these narrow columns. So um, this is what it says at the bottom. It says, this is all a file name, okay? I'm just going to read the whole thing to you. First issue, dash D3, which means we've gone over it three times, it's perfect, dash ML, dash MP, dash ST, dash AM, dash AX, dash AR, dash SS, dash MB, dash AL, dot PDF. And when Michael's brother was printing this, he says, there's a, a weird file name. You want me to delete that, right? I'm like, no, that goes on the mug. And he was just like, oh, Okay. <laughs> I was like, everyone that helps make the magazine is here in the file name. And so when, when each person gets their mug, they'll see their initials. So yeah, like I said, it was a fun project and um, everyone loved it. That's the best part. And I asked everyone, are you a righty or are you a lefty? Because I, I really wanted like, if there was left-handed people, when they drink, I don't want the logo to be upside down. Well, guess what? The only person that was left-handed was the owner of the magazine. And I just said, he's going to have to drink out of his right hand. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Everyone else was a righty. So it works uh, and it's great. And it makes me laugh every time I look at it. So I'm drinking out of it constantly um, because I'm in the mood of working on coral all the time. And I have been working on it a lot this week. Um, the one we're working on now will come out uh, I'm sorry, it will be printing in a month. I mean, it's like the deadline is looming, 30 days, lots to do. Um, I also wanted to show you some things I got today in the mail. It was actually not today, yesterday. Came in the mail, it was a gift from VCA. So he told me he was going to send me something. He's going to send me one of these. This little tiny thing. But then the box shows up and it's this long. <laughs> it's, it's this huge box. And I'm like, what is happening? So I open up the box, and inside are these giant tweezers that are 3D printed and made of the right type of plastic so that it will not, you know, hurt your livestock. 
and I mean ginormous, but great for my tank. My tank's 30 inches tall. These are 18 inches long. And you know, last weekend I burned the crap out of my knuckle I told you about. And so I have not been putting in salt water. So having something where I can put my hand in less to do what I gotta do down low, like to remove something really quickly was ideal. I was like, oh, I know exactly what to use this for. And I, I ran to the tank because I um, had something that fell to the bottom and I needed to retrieve it. So according to uh, Antonio, can't rust. It does glow. It is reef safe. Uh, it should not sink. I didn't test that. And uh, it says about dexterity and control, but I just wanted to let you guys know, so in case you're worried, it does work for right-handed people and for left-handed people. <laughs> so pretty neat, right? And uh, yeah, I like it. And you know, because they're bright orange, which I normally would not gravitate toward, when I put it in the bucket and I need it later, I can find it instantly because I don't have anything bright orange other than these now and maybe a tape measure. So now back to the dot, okay? I um I saw him post a thing about these on Facebook. Now I'm gonna put that little thing on the screen you saw before. He's calling them bonbon minis, and they're made of rubber. You can squish them, and they have a little hole on the back. And the idea is that you could put this on the end of tubing that is submerged as a pre-filter and prevent detritus and crap from getting sucked into a pump. Like for example, in my situation, I have a calcium reactor with a Versa pump. The pump draws water from the sump, just whatever the water is, goes through the Versa pump and then into the calcium reactor. Now, the tubing can get clogged with detritus and stuff that's in the bottom of the sump. But if I can put this over the end of my tube and like keep it protected, in theory, it'll um, keep all the detritus out of the lines. So I was looking at it. I, I haven't installed it yet, but he said, you know, you can insert little tiny tubing. Well, um, here's tiny tubing, and then here would be the size of an of a RODI system, you know, quarter inch. And the quarter inch is really, really hard for me to press in there. I, I don't even know if I could. Maybe it's possible if you really try hard, but um, it doesn't seem to want to go in. So I may have to drill that out slightly because the tubing that I have running from the Versa is actually kind of soft. So it's so malleable, it would probably be really impossible to put in here without a larger opening with less resistance so I can just get it on the end and protect it. And I said, well, how long is it going to last? And, you know, he says, we really don't know. But he says, that's why you get a multi-pack. So you can just take it out and you can put another one on. You can rinse it out. And uh, I was like, all right, that's kind of neat. So I got myself some bonbons from VCA and they are, that's the official packaging. This is what I got. It's a blank. There's no information at all. What, yeah. See, I'm, I'm sharing you all the behind the scenes stuff. I'm probably not allowed to do that, so I'll remove it. <laughs> no, that one's okay. I can leave it on the screen. <laughs> um, uh, what else do I have that I wanted to mention with you guys today? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, let's just get into the topic. Okay, so filtration. It all comes down to the size of the aquarium you have, of course. You know my reef, which is a 400 gallon, has a sump underneath it. It has a protein skimmer. It has a refugium zone. It has a reactor to put carbon inside. And if I'm not running carbon, I could put something else in there like bio pellets. Or for a while there, I was using nitrate R from Brightwell. I filled it up and the stuff was uh, super buoyant and it would help lower the nitrate of the aquarium just as the water passes through it. It, it wasn't like you needed some kind of, um, oh, let me just delve into sponges and filter socks and fleece rollers. These are all different ways of catching particulates in the water column that are organic in nature and could possibly break down if they are not removed from the aquarium. So uh, let me uh, talk about filter socks for a second. I haven't talked about them for a while. I personally rarely, rarely use them. Uh, I find them to be a hassle, hard to clean. I mean, just hassle factor is in, I mean, like right now, tomorrow, no, I'm sorry, today's Saturday, Monday, it's supposed to be really cold, like 10 degrees here and possible snow, which is really rare in Texas. You know, in this part of Texas, we hardly get snow. If we do, we get it for one day and that's it. And it's gone. It's beautiful. Enjoy it. Look at it. Wait till everyone ruins it with their, you know, their cars and their feet. And the next thing you know, it's just gone. But, um, in those conditions, I'm not going to be outside with the garden hose trying to clean filter socks, right? I'd have to do it inside. 
Uh, and, you know, sometimes they're hard to invert to clean them properly. Some people like to soak them in bleach water or soak them in, uh, or, or even put them in the washing machine and let them run through the wash cycle and then, you know, rinse them well and make sure they're super clean and dechlorinated and uh, de-soaped. You know, so there's no chemicals whatsoever in them, so they're safe to put back in your aquarium. But the thing is, they don't, uh, you can't just use them and leave them and ignore them. Matter of fact, you have to remove them about every three days. And the reason being is because as long as stuff's sitting inside the sock and water is flowing through it, that stuff is still polluting the water every second of the day. I mean, okay, you put in a brand new sock three hours ago. And then two hours ago, you're like, let me feed my fish. So you put the food in the tank, the food goes, you know, all over the place, and a bunch of it goes down the drain and into the filter sock, and the, the fish never got it, the invertebrates never got it. It's just sitting there, sticking to the walls of the sock, and it is breaking down, and it is adding to the nitrate and phosphate of your aquarium, which you don't want to happen. And that's just been for the last two hours, right? So we want to, and then you think about it, if I'm not changing my sock all week, some people don't. Some people wait till it overflows to change the sock. And that's not how they're designed. To, I mean, they're obviously not doing anything when they're overflowing. At this point, everything going in is tumbling out. That means everything, the detritus, the waste, uh, the, the excess food, all that stuff, it's just tumbling out too. It, it's not being contained anymore. You think it's just sitting at the bottom nicely? No, the whole sock is packed and it no more porosity. And the water is, it's just going into a, a brick vase and coming back out the top. That's what it's doing. So instead, you're going to need to remove them in a timely fashion. And the general rule is every three days. And if you're not doing it every three days, you're doing it wrong. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. Now, if you have a humongous sump that has like six or eight socks, you may be able to have a longer duration because there's so much vertical fabric. For example, MRC makes these gorgeous sumps. I think they're made out of PVC. I'll double check. And they'll have like six or eight seven inch socks that are probably like 18 or 20 inches tall. I mean, just insane. But the water is flowing from the tank and then goes down all these socks. It goes down the sleeves of the socks. And, you know, the water is low in that area. It's not, it's not filled up. The sock isn't sitting in a bunch of water. The water flows down the sock and then there's a low area and it travels to the next zone. It's, it's well designed, right? And then as the sock becomes more dense near the bottom, the water level rises to weep out the fabric. And then it rises higher to weep out the fabric and it rises higher until the entire darn thing is just coated with this gunk, right? And for a aquarium that's being serviced by a company that comes every two weeks, or God, what if they came once a month? That's crazy. But the point is they have time before they come back to deal with cleaning these socks. Public aquariums, another time, have, on the other hand, have socks that are like 36 inches long. It's insane. I've seen them. And they will be behind the giant aquarium, you know, in the area where the public does not go. And they have all these socks on the ground, on the concrete. And there's a garden hose looped on the wall. And there's usually a floor drain right there. And they're just blasting these socks clean daily. And uh, constantly cleaning them out because there's so much waste. Because a lot of times public aquariums will have these big exhibits with a lot of fish density. And so they're putting a lot of food in. There's a lot of waste coming out. And they have to keep up with removing as much as they can from the system uh, before you even talk about protein skimmers and sand filters and all the other things that can be done. They rely heavily on this mechanical form of filtration, which would be trapping the organics in a filter sock. Okay. If for some reason you become the person that says, oh my God, I agree with Mark, I hate socks, I never want to run them again, I'm just not going to install them. You might say, wow, my sump is so loud now. I mean, what do I do? Because the water is, you know, pouring to the spot where the sock belongs, but there is no sock. So it's cascading into the water level that might be three, six inches lower. And uh, th that noise is driving me crazy. Well, I've got a solution for you that's really, really simple. And all you do is you take a sock uh, that fits that, that holder and you just cut off the bottom. <laughs> just make it, you know, like let's say it's a 12 inch sock. You cut it at six inches or whatever's the right height so that the fabric will at least touch the water. That's all you need. And now water can flow down the walls quietly as can be, but it's not trapping organics. It's not doing anything. And the water's just passing through and going into the protein skimmer zone and then the refugium zone and so forth. 
And if you do that, you know, if you want to clean that from time to time, you can, but it's really, it's just going to be things stuck to it just out of pure luck. It is not filtering your system. It's nothing to rely on. It's just a way to get the water from the top to the bottom of the sump absolutely quietly. And it's a one-time thing. It's super easy to do. And I've, I've recommend, matter of fact, I was at the aquarium in DC and I told them, I said, you know, you have these, all these holes where the socks go. And he goes, yeah, we don't use those. It's too much work. I was like, okay, well, it's crazy loud back here. He goes, yeah, we know. And so I told him my idea and he goes, that's brilliant. I'm, we're totally going to do that. So I am assuming they did. And they're probably even happier now because it's not so noisy behind the aquarium. Okay. Let me see if we got any comments because I told you I wanted to interact with you guys and not just ignore the chat. But I did want to start off with a couple of things like that. Paul says, I'm a subscriber for three years. That is awesome. Thank you for subscribing to Coral Magazine. Uh, Insane Reefer asks a question. I need a 10 gallon holding tank for caulkwasser with a lid and possibly a small hole in the top for a float valve. Can you build me one? Yep, I absolutely can. I recently made one for a customer, I think about a month ago, and he wanted it to be as completely sealed as possible so no air got in there. And so you, we, we could do something similar, obviously. There will be the slightest amount of air sucking in from around the lid that you use to refill it and that, or to clean it out. And that's okay. That's not like constant fresh air just hitting your caulkwasser. So just send me an email and uh, I will be able to help you take care of that. Okay, Hillbilly Reefer says, absolute must-haves in my opinion are the skimmer and the refugium. A carbon reactor is a secondary item for a monthly three-day yeah monthly three -day water polish. Simple but most effective. Yes, I, I do agree with you on carbon. Um, I have a couple of really good articles on milosreef.com that were written by someone else and they made so much sense that when those articles vanished from the web, I hunted down the author and said, would you please allow me to host your articles on my website in perpetuity because I don't want your information to be lost. And he wrote me back an email. He says, I'm honored that you even asked me that. And he's like, yes, you have permission. I took a screenshot of his email reply and stuck it in the top of the article so no one can be mad at me because yeah, people are always having opinions, right? And uh, he talked about how he, you know, he really felt... How do I say this? It was He had a lot of information about granulated activated carbon and its benefits. And it was actually a two-part story. It was that much information. And what I really got from it was it doesn't last long. It doesn't need a lot of flow through it. And it works really, really well. And uh, so I, like you, Hillabilly Reefer, I run mine for about three days. If it keeps running after that, it's, it's not doing anything. And if any, you know, the longer you leave it there, the more likely it will actually be a negative to your system because the stuff that was trapped in there is now just like the socks breaking down and possibly creating a nitrate bed that's creating nitrate instead of uh, just being a way to polish the water and make the water nice and crystal clear. And you know, carbon can absorb a lot of things, but if you're only doing it for three days a month, you don't have to worry about possibly stripping out everything. That's one of those uh, things I hear. I don't even know if it's a truism or a myth, but there's this concern that if you run too much carbon that you're taking out all the trace elements, you're taking out all the everything, and you're just stripping the system. I don't know. Uh, I think if you overdo anything in life, you're probably gonna, it's probably detrimental to the system. Usually I just go with a really logical uh, approach with carbon. I get some fresh carbon. I um, will clean. I put it in a reactor. I'm not a fan of carbon sitting inside a mesh bag that you just put in the corner of the sump or you jam it between the baffles or uh, you hang it off the corner of the sump with a string or something whatever people it that is called passive filtration and you're just kind of hoping that the water in the system is somehow interacting with this mesh bag and permeating it and getting on the carbon the carbon's absorbing stuff and then it's flowing out as more water somehow flowing in and it's it's not it's it, you're just like dangling a bag in a body of water and hoping all the water in the system is somehow making contact with this bag. I don't know that it actually could. I, I'd love to see a fluid dynamics demonstration showing this magic because I, I just don't think that's realistic. So does it work? Yes. Does it work great when it's brand new? Absolutely. But if it's been sitting in there for a month and the whole mesh bag is brown, what do you think it's actually doing? Because what I believe is happening is the mesh bag is now completely coated with a bacteria. 
and it is now less porous than it was at the beginning, at the start. And water now is just going to go around this obstacle because it can't get through it because the coating of the bag is so thick and dense with this goo, you know, this bacterial mass. So you would have to literally be like squeezing the bag frequently to get that stuff off to uh, basically reveal the, the, the mesh material to the water column again. And I've seen people where they jam it into the baffles, you know, like, well, my water has to go through the baffles, so I know it's going to go through these bags. Yes, on day one, it's going through the bags for sure. By day three, there's probably a nice little barrier of crap that accumulate on top of the fabric. And then, you know, after a little while, you look and you'll see the water is really not going under as much as it's going over the baffle to the next zone because there's this thing in the way, this mattress. <laughs> so we want to make sure that uh, the mesh bag is clean and fresh and there for a short duration. But really, I would go, I would push away the passive filtration concept entirely, and I would be an aggressive, I was going to say aggressive. I would want to be, use active filtration. So active filtration is when you put carbon in a reactor. Water flows down the center of the reactor, it bubbles up through the carbon, does its job, and continues out. And it's constantly bringing you, it's forcing water in with a power head, you know, with a pump. And if you're doing that, you're going to get the best possible results. And normally, if you were to go to the end of your aquarium and, and look at it, and you're like, huh, it looks kind of murky. It's not crystal clear like it is from the front. That's because there's a lot of organics in the water. So running filter socks is one method to start trapping it. And running granulated activated carbon is the other way to remove some of the yellowing of the water and to get that clarity back. Now, one quick thing, just a side note, when you get better clarity, that means the lights are gonna penetrate better. So if you've not done this in a super long time and suddenly you say, it's 2024, I'm gonna make my water better, you might need to adjust your lights down 10% or so, so you do not uh, cook the livestock that's so used to getting a certain amount of par through the murky water that is your aquarium. And I'm not, I, I'm not picturing in my mind brown, ugly tanks. I'm talking about a tank that's just not clear now it is, the light's going to penetrate harder, and you could actually get a little bit of bleaching on corals that are so used to that lesser amount of uh, penetration by the light. Now, the carbon is in the reactor, and like I said, after three days, just remove it. And now, for 27 days, you don't have to worry that your tank is stripping, you know, that you're stripping out the, uh, the metals, or you're stripping out the, you know, like, uh, when I say metals, it's like iron and... Uh, <laughs> wow, I have a brain, I have no idea what other metals are good. A little trace of copper is actually normal in the aquarium. And we're not trying to get everything out. And so just doing a three-day polishing is a smart approach. And then after that, you've got the rest of the month where you're just allowing everything to exist in the tank. And you're not going to remove trace elements. You're not going to remove it, you know, phytoplankton. You're not going to remove anything. Nothing's going to, there's nothing for it to stick to because you've removed it from the system. But if you leave it in there long term, it could potentially... Uh, remove more than it should. And also, you don't want to use too much. So the general rule is half a cup per 50 gallons. So in my tank, uh, I use about two and a half cups for 450 gallons, and that seems to be working out quite well. I don't even count the cups anymore because I just have a reactor and I, I, I scoop it and fill it to a certain height, and I just know visually how much that is. Um, also, a little trick, and I saw this on Instagram. Um, there was a I think it was, uh, I think his name is Bayside Reefer. Man, if I got that wrong, I'm sorry. But uh, he showed this really nice video of how he changes the carbon on his reactor uh, under his reef tank. And it was actually really interesting because his reactor was mounted to this manifold that hangs from the underneath of the aquarium somehow. So it was actually floating in air. And he reached up there and he turned a valve in the video and then he unscrewed this union and just plunked the reactor off the bottom and went to go clean it and do its thing in the sink. And I was like, oh, I like that. That's kind of cool. It's not just standing in the bottom of the sump. It's literally at eye level and stays cleaner because, of, I mean, everything was so pristine. But during the video, and it was all t uh, time lapse, so super fast, I watched he take a paper towel and jam it in the downpipe so no, uh, gravel, uh, no carbon could go down there when he's refilling it. And I thought immediately, why would you use a paper towel when you can just put a shot glass on top? And so, of course, I replied, and he's like, that's brilliant. <laughs> I've been using the shot glass thing for like 10, 15 years. I mean, it's actually, I have a really funny looking shot glass. It's like this tall and really narrow, and, it's some, and it says Texas on it. I don't even know where I got it, 
but it's great because it fits in any size reactor compared to like a wider glass might uh, obscure the area you need to pour in the carbon. But you take your half a cup of carbon for 50 gallons, you put it in your reactor with the shot glass on top so it doesn't go down the downpipe, and then you put your sponges back in place. You put your, your and, not, and then at that point, you fill the reactor up with tap water. <laughs> Shocking. And you just let it rinse out the carbon so that way there's no more carbon dust inside the reactor. And I just take my hand and turn it upside down. The sponge is keeping the media inside and I drain the water out. I fill it with tap water again, shake it around, pour it out two, three times. And if the, once the water comes out clear and there's no black, then I can put the lid on it, take it to the tank, install it to my system and let it do its job. And then after, you know, and the next day, my water looks really, really clean. And like I said, when you look at it from the end of the tank, you're like, look at that. The clarity is fantastic. I can see the full length of my tank. It just looks really, really good. And then if you do that again in three days, you're like, huh, it's not as clear. If you wait a week, it's definitely not as clear. It's not horrible. It's just not as clear as it was when you polish the water with the carbon. So carbon is a good benefit to the tank when you don't abuse it and overuse it and leave it in the system too long. All right, uh, Ziggy says, uh, I replaced the filtration with live rock rubble tower and a tiny refugium. I've got live rock and live sand in the display. Uh, previous systems had live rock, live sand, a large refugium and skimmer. I would use a media reactor as needed. Maximum raids, you just don't know me very well. <laughs> If you wanted super short videos, you should go to my Reef Diaries because they are about three minutes long, maybe four minutes, and they get straight to the point. And there's about 150 of them on this channel. Uh, the live stream is a conversation and I tell stories and it's it's a, uh, what do they call it? Long, uh, long, long, uh, there's a term for it. Uh, long form. And uh, we just chat. That's what this is. That's why we do these. Um. Oh, Alex says, with a big refugium, I was able to remove the protein skimmer from my system. Interestingly, uh, when I was reading the article from Daniel Knopf that's coming out in this issue, he for a long time recommended that you run a protein skimmer for like the first few years during the ugly phase, basically, is what he said. And then after um, a duration you just remove the skimmer for the duration of the aquarium. And I'm just reading like, I'm like really? And, uh, but then, you know, he changes his mind and you'll see why in his article, which I thought was interesting too. Paul says, I change my socks every day. I do too, but those are the ones on my feet. <laughs> but no, that's great. I'm really, I'm just joking. That's really great actually. And I, I, there was something I used to do a long time ago and it was just a, a habit and I just felt like my 280 gallon which was turning six years old it had um it was really really a heavy bio load it was the tank was maxed out it was full there was no room for anything it was gorgeous glorious and yet I was concerned that my filtration could not keep up and so one of my routines was to clean the skimmer every single day and by clean the skimmer I mean every single day I would go to the skimmer which was behind the aquarium in my sump where I could just walk up to it and I could take the lid off and I had a, a all plastic toilet cleaning brush and I would go inside the neck and inside the body of the skimmer every single day to knock off anything that tried to attract to the inside walls of the skimmer and the neck of the protein of the the collection cup and then I took the cup to the sink and I washed it really clean and put it back on and I did that every day it only took me like 10 minutes and I knew my skimmer was running at at the absolute um most uh, efficiency and it did a great job i mean i i didn't have real major problems you know we we all know i always tend to have nitrate and phosphate in my system usually because of the bio load and because of the food that i dump in my friend evan says just back up the dump truck and drop in all the food and i never feel like it's that much but he always said it was terrible let's see Triggerfish says, I don't change my socks till they overflow, otherwise my nutrients drop too low. Well, you could always uh, go ahead and up the um, the frequency of how often you run a sock. You don't have to have them in there all the time. You could put them in for three days each week instead of waiting for them to overflow. 
Robert, thank you so much for subscribing. That's awesome. I hope you enjoy Amazonas. It's made for those freshwater people. And of course, I love coral. I've been a subscriber myself for a long time. Lincoln Town says, any idea what would kill Montipora? I have all the expensive gear. Apex, Trident, Dose, Radiance, etc. I do a 15% water change each uh, every week. I can't keep SPS alive long term, especially Monty's. It could be that you have a fish that's nipping at them and eating the polyps right off of them. And that happened to me in the past where I had a brand new little Montipora digitata, which is a little stick. And, I, and it was really pretty. It was kind of a honey brown or a honey gold, whatever you want to call that, with bright blue polyps. They called it the German blue polyped Monty at the time. They, they didn't have fancy names back in the day. And I put that in, and the next day it was bone white dead. I was like, what? And I got really mad at the fish store and said, you sold me a bad frag. And you know, I came home with another one, and I put it in the tank, and I looked at it, and my flame angel went chomp, 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 chomp. And I was like, oh, it wasn't a bad frag at all. I have a fish that eats Montipora. So it could be a fish thing. You know, having good gear is important, but the water parameters have to be just right. And you have to also look uh, at the trace elements. You can't, you can't ignore them. Uh, if your tank is like severely deficient in uh, potassium, then you could have a problem with any kind of SPS. And you'll have SPS that you think are so pretty, you put them in your tank and they turn brown or they, they lose their green. Those are kind of things that can happen when numbers are not right. So you've got to make sure they're all right. And you got to make sure you don't have livestock that's actually chewing on it. There's also out there a pest that eats Montipora. And if your tank has some, they will continually target them forever. And what you have to do is let the tank run without the Monty's for like a long duration. There was a guy here in my local area, a club member, who had a really bad infestation of Montipore eating nudibranchs, and he just could not get rid of them. And there was really no effective dip that could do it. You know, you had to visually inspect the corals, find the, the nudibranchs. You had to then uh, pick them off with like tweezers, and you had to find the eggs and scrape those off with like a toothpick. And it was a whole ordeal. And it was actually better to find a healthy part of the coral and break that off and save it and throw away all the rest and start fresh than to try to salvage the whole colony because those things are just so tiny and they're so abundant. They, they make so much of themselves. They become super abundant. And when they, when two, I always joke, when two of those nudibranchs touch, that's it. A thousand eggs come out. And that's because I actually observed something almost exactly like that. I had someone give me a bucket of Montipora once. I came home from work, and there was just this five-gallon bucket on my front doorstep. I'm like, what is this? And I lift the lid, and it's just tons of Montipora. I was like, wow, cool. So I was like, what do I do with this? And I had this frag tank running, and I just said, I'll put them in there. And then I saw the nudibranchs everywhere. I was like, oh, no. So I uh, would siphon them out as quick as I could find them. But it just seemed like literally I'd see, um, I, I assumed, male and female, that was my guess, they just literally, you saw two of them do this, and then there was a thousand more. It was just, it was the craziest thing. So I ended up throwing it all away. I, there was no salvaging any of it, and it's just no point. So uh, if you can find a piece that is healthy, you know, the coral's healthy, and there's nothing on it, you know, it's all living tissue, that's a good sign. Because these nudibranchs, I, I'm not saying you have them, but I'm just sharing the story. These nudibranchs, when they lay the eggs, they lay them right on the border between living tissue and dead skeleton, right at that line, you know, right at the border. And as soon as the eggs hatch, they walk straight to the skin and start eating, and they just mow it down. And then as they become bigger and become mature and become adult, then they will do the touching thing, and boom, you have more of them, again, right on the perimeter of the living and dead, and they continue to eat and they continue and continue, and it's, just, it's exponentially a problem. So if you just say, forget it, there, let's say the piece of coral is six inches wide and the dead tissues, you know, at the end here, you might just cut it at the three inch mark. You know, just break off a piece and you look at it, there's absolutely nothing on it, but just living tissue and the white part where it's snapped off jaggedly. And you'll, you could dip it, but again, there shouldn't be anything on it. You could just throw away the rest and put that piece in a safe spot, glue it onto the rock work and start anew. But anyway, my buddy who had this huge infestation couldn't control it. He eventually just gave up. He let them eat everything. He removed everything he could, and whatever was left, they devoured, and he just left the tank alone. He just gave up on Montipora for probably like a year. And then one day he says, you know what? I'm going to try it again. And he put them in, 
and everything was great. And I remember asking him, so whatever happened? He says, oh, yeah, I got a tank full of Montipora now. I love it. I'm so happy. I was like, well, how did you solve it? He says, I waited a year. <laughs> I was like, wow, really? And he's like, yeah, by then there was none alive and uh, of those pests. And he ended up getting you know, the tank right back to where he wanted it. But yeah, leaving it fallow for the duration of how long it takes for all of their generations to to hatch and go out looking for food and starve and, and uh, die, then you'll end up with a, a, a tank that's safe again. It's just like when you take all the fish out of a tank and leave it fallow and you have it fallow for like six or eight weeks to eliminate any chance of ick being in the system and all your fish are in corn or in a hospital tank being treated for ick to make sure that they're ick free. And then when you finally put them in, you never have ick again. That's the principle. Uh, Donald says, can a roller mat filter keep phosphate elevated? It really shouldn't because roller mats, the way they work, they have the fabric and the water sitting on them and passing through the material. And as the material gets clogged, like I talked about earlier with the filter socks, the mechanism, well, the water level rises a little bit higher, which triggers the motor to advance the fabric forward to where you just have a nice clean fabric again. So all the stuff that's dirty should be uh, elevating out of the water on a regular basis and amassing on the roll, like a toilet paper roll that's being uh, filled up, which is kind of the opposite of how we would ever use one. And all that stuff's out of the system and not sitting in the water column. So it should not. Uh, the Zen Ginger says, is there any chance the referral benefits you if we subscribe to both as opposed to just Coral Magazine? Or is it beneficial to you either way uh, with the bundle deal? The referral thing is literally just so Matt can say, hey, Mark, you sold 10 subscriptions. That's all it does. It's just a way to know where you came from. Uh, but I did find out that it gives a slightly better discount than the normal cover price that we uh, sell it as a subscription. The subscription for one magazine is 39 and for both is 69 And if you use the referral for the Coral Magazine, it's like 37 instead of 39 so you save two bucks. Um, but no, just use whichever you want. I, I'm happy to see subscri subscriptions coming in. I, I want to watch those numbers build up and get bigger and bigger. I would like to see everyone in the nation with magazines in their hands. Radar says, I have a 220 gallon mixed reef. Um, I'm going to assume it's a 55 gallon sump with skimmer, media reactor, uh, algae scrubber. Oh, algae scrubbers. And then a UV sterilizer. The uh, algae scrubber is another interesting one that has become more and more popular in the last mm, three years. And I've been running one myself for a couple. And it's definitely, can it, it's a challenge. But the good news is there's an article coming out about algae tear scrubbers in this next issue of Coral. And it's going to go into why dosing trace elements will yield better results. So that is something Kenneth Wingerter wrote about. And you're going to have that to look at and give you inspiration to get on the trace element kick with me. Which, by the way, I mentioned last week I wanted to be better about in 2024. So I happened to be on the phone yesterday with Chris Meckley at ACI. And we were talking about one thing, and he says, so how's your dosing going? Are you putting in um, MT? I was like, no, I haven't done it in like six or eight months. I am being a bad Milev. And he, he just like, what are we going to do with you? I was like, literally, I just spoke about this last weekend on the stream, saying I need to be better about it. And I said, this is probably the push I needed to get on the ball. So what Chris told me to do, which is super easy, he said, put in the uh, MT, which is the stuff specifically designed for people that run algae turf scrubbers. He said, do that for 10 days and then take a water sample and send it to Reef Labs and we'll get you the exact recipe of what you need for your next batch of dosing trace elements so you know if you need iron, if you need vanadium, if you need cesium, if you need selenium, if you need manganese. You know, it, it, and I, I completely agree. I said, that's totally what I'm going to do. So I can tell you that my reef, which I can show you guys here. Uh, we had this on here. This was shot a week ago. And the reef... Let me turn this down. Uh, the reef is looking fine. It's uh, just not looking amazing. And it's because the lack of trace elements that made the difference between corals popping and corals just existing. Uh, there's that one spot in the front where it's kind of green and yellow. That is because some of, one or two of my fish have decided that chalice is edible 
and they're eating it. <laughs> so I am trying to be better at putting nori in the tank and get their lips off my corals and keep them on the nori uh, instead. But um, yeah, tank is, it's doing okay. I just want it to look a little bit better. And I do need to work in there more, but I haven't because of the injuries in my fingers. I don't want to put them in water at this time because I don't want to risk a bacterial infection in my bloodstream. To the next question here. Uh, Insane Reefer says, I just did my water testing. Nitrate is 24, phosphate is 0.18, uh, alkalinity is 10, calcium is 400, magnesium is 1380. And after that, I did a 20% water change. So all that great water, and then you sucked it out. <laughs> no, I'm really glad you did that. That's good. That's what we need to be, is be on top of our, our knowing our water testing. As you know, it's Water Test Saturday. And doing those water changes from time to time is definitely going to help with making, keeping, maintaining good water quality. Let me go ahead and switch back here. Bay Area Reef. Thank you, Reef Keeper. You have the same reactor? You have it hanging like that? It's such a neat look. Uh, I've never done that. I was kind of impressed. Now, the reactor I have is probably 24 inches tall. So I would probably need some kind, something that's more cute that could, uh, what should we call it, dangle from beneath the aquarium stand. Uh, Lincoln says, have you ever had a radion not able to communicate with Mobius? I have three XR15s and can't save my settings because one light times out. Sometimes there are challenges getting each piece of your Ecotech gear to talk with Mobius. And I believe the solution is to get one, unplug them all, like everything, and plug in the one item, get it connected to Mobius, and then unplug it, <clears throat> plug in the next item, get it connected to Mobius, and then you do all, and then when you're all done, you can plug everything back in and hopefully it's all present. Uh, if that doesn't work, then it's, it's a call to tech support and see if Ecotech can help you get that resolved. Hmm. Oh, also, yeah, Insane Reefer also made the comment, sometimes you need to like remove the item from Mobius and make it find it new, like uh, detect new devices and maybe get it incorporated that way. <clears throat> Sorry, something's in my throat. By the way, someone made a comment that I'm not as loud today. I didn't change anything on audio. Grr. I just wanted it to work week after week. Uh, Kevin says, can scratches on the outside of the glass tank be buffed out or improved? Actually, they can. It's the inside that we always want to fix and we really can't. So... <clears throat> I think it's something called cesium oxide. And you can talk to a glass company because, I mean, I was just trying to think of examples of scratch glass. I'm going to assume the side of glass, you know, buildings have glass that sometimes get scratched. Windshields get scratched. Stuff like that needs to be polished. There's got to be a way. There may be dust issues that you need to contend with, and you'll need to go ahead and uh, <clears throat> prepare the room for it or pretend the prepare the tank. You don't want any of that stuff to get into the aquarium if it's a rimless, for example. Uh, you don't want them to put excessive pressure on the tank, and they should know better. But uh, it is something to you know at least mention, like, hey, how hard are you going to press on the glass when you're doing this? And if they say, oh, I have a ginger touch, then you're safe because they'll just you know buff, 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 you know, to make this evaporate. But yeah, outside scratches can definitely be fixed on an aquarium. <clears throat> Ah, there you go. John Wright said, my friend lost nearly all of his corals and didn't know why, and I told him it might be his flame angel, and since then he's seen it nip at them. And, you know, I put a couple of corals from ACI and Caitlin's Reef with the, uh, pig with the <clears throat> Japanese pygmy angelfish, and the corals did not do well. And, I mean, the zooanthids were fine, and the recordias were fine, but, like, I I'd gotten this little tiny, um, not a... Scalemia, not a scoli. I think those are different. <laughs> and uh, we also put in this little, this really pretty alveopora I, I picked out in person while I was there. <clears throat> and the coral would barely open up, and maybe one side would open, the other wouldn't. I was like, what is happening? And Amanda said, maybe you got too much flow. And I was like, really? And uh, I watched that fish for so long and it never went near that thing i mean it swims everywhere and it's always on the move but i never saw it picking at that thing at all i don't know if maybe the pistol shrimp comes out at night and destroys lps 
<laughs> but I lost my little frog spawn that I was really happy about, and I lost that Alvia Poor, and I lost that... L it's like no LPSs in that tank. So I'm thinking I might lean into... Oh my god, I can't believe I'm saying it. Mushrooms? I might put some mushrooms in there for some rock coverage, because I do think that they look nice um, in a tank where, you know, you're limited. I'm very, very, very selective what goes in that tank because I don't want to put anything in that could kill my angelfish and I don't want to put anything in that the angelfish will kill. So I have to be really, really picky what goes in that tank at this point. I can't just put in anything I want. Uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, GFO is more likely to strip your water. Um, are you still getting good algae growth through your algae reactor? I haven't seen an update lately. No, uh, I cannot get to the algae reactor. I've talked about this so many times. And because I can't get to it, I'm not cleaning it frequently enough. And so when I finally get around to it, it's just slimy inside and it's messed up. Also, my iron levels are depleted in the system. And I just put in some yesterday. I need to get back on track of dosing iron because even my refugium doesn't flourish like it did in the past. So I know that that's been completely depleted and needs to be replenished, which is why dosing isolate MT is going to be a good thing because it's going to be good for the algae inside the reactor, the uh, scrubber, as well as in the refugium. Uh, the there's plant there's products that are sold by Brightwell like um, Kato Grow, and I believe that's got iron and uh, probably potassium and a couple other things. And people put those in on a regular basis, once a week, and it helps to make the macroalgaes grow where you need them to grow. So it's you know valid question. And yeah, interesting that you talked about GFO stripping out something out of the water. I definitely know that too much GFO can be bad for the system. And this is all part of filtration still. It's not a mechanical filter, but it's an adsorber and it absorbs. Uh, the goal is for it to attract the phosphate from the water column and stick to the media. And then when you take the media out and throw it away and put in clean media, new media, it continues to strip away and, and or I'm sorry, collect the phosphate. And um, since we're talking about filtration today, I want to talk about GFO briefly because, you know, if you're not familiar with it, GFO is granular ferric oxide. It basically looks like rust in a jar. We put it into a reactor. It should be rinsed very well before it's hooked up to the system. And then when you hook it up to the system, you should not let the output go straight into the system because when you hook it up and you turn on the pump that feeds it, it will then push air down the tube before the water can go in because there's already air there, right? So the water goes in and pushes the air down and it burps all the rust, the GFO, and then it goes into suspension and it wants to come out the tube and then that stuff can travel into the tank and it can burn the gills of the fish. So when you set up GFO and, you hook, and you've rinsed it at the sink and now it's safe to use, you set it up and, and wherever it is and near your, uh, your system, maybe it's hanging above the sump on a bracket or something or maybe it's a reactor like two little fishies like i have used in the past where you set it in the sump then the tube that comes out of the reactor goes into a nearby bucket you turn it on and you you set the flow rate that you prefer which is going to be really really slow it should be just enough that the media is just barely tumbling it's i call it a moon quake it's like a slow motion lava lamp it's not going way up it's just doing this little tiny it's just movement, like an earthquake, but it's a moonquake because it's slow motion, right? And then the liquid is coming out and you want that to come out probably for a half gallon to a gallon. And you might even see some of the fines in the bucket if it's a white bucket, it's really obvious then. And then once after that that time for the any of that stuff that got burped up uh, settles back down and the rest got exported, you can move the tube back into your system and let it do its job. And then to verify if it's working, you measure the phosphate of the tank and then you measure the phosphate of the output of the GFO reactor. If your phosphate is 0.1 and the liquid coming out of the reactor is zero, it's working perfectly. If you put it, if it's going in one and coming out one, it's doing nothing. If it's going in one and coming out three, it is well spent, gone beyond what it could ever do and it's releasing it back into the system. Now, if you have that one-to-one -one ratio and it's new media, like you put it in at 0.1, it's coming out 0.1, slow the flow even more because you need it to come out at like 0 0.05 or 0 0.03 or like I said, zero. That's how you dial those in. Uh, I did not know this uh, initially that Julian Sprung recommended that about once a week you open the valve to kind of puff the media slightly and then set it back to the right rate again 
and that helps avoid the media in the reactor calcifying because it interacts with the alkalinity in the system and it can actually turn to a brick. And there you are, you've unscrewed your reactor and you've got this long handle screwdriver and you're stabbing it, trying to break it up to get it out of the reactor. That's the, uh, it's a reaction to calcium, uh, to, I said alkalinity because I thought it was alkalinity, but I might be wrong. It might be calcification, it could be calcium. But regardless, if it's turning hard to stone, again, it's not doing anything and it's hard to get out of the reactor. So his trick was open the valve slightly, reset it, and that way it puffs a little bit, but not enough to create a giant, you know, swirl in the reactor and your media will work. And typically GFO is good for probably a month, possibly two, and then needs to be replaced. It's not something you can just indefinitely run and forget about. Scott Zinn did his water testing. Everyone's posting the results. I love this. He said his nitrate was three. Um, phosphate is 0.25. pH, I don't even know what's happening here. pH can't be 0.25. Um, alkaline is 8.0, calcium is 10, and calcium, uh, mag calcium is 10, mag calcium is, <laughs> alkalinity is 10, calcium is 440, magnesium is 1350, and salinity is 1.024. Oh, I bet that pH is 8.25. That's probably what that was. Insane Reefer says, any update on the Salaford potassium test kit? I'd love to do more testing on that, but they seem to be out of stock everywhere. I forgot. I will make myself a note because I did forget that. I said last week I would check and I did not do it. All right. I'll get back to you, Insane Reefer. Is that your username on Instagram by any chance? That way I can get a hold of you because I won't know what email to contact you at because I don't memorize real names with nicknames necessarily. Oh, that's crazy. Reefkeeper says that Chewy has them in stock. Wow, that's cool. All right, well, there's a source. But in the meantime, I'll definitely check too because I know that you guys like to get things from me as well. <laughs> yes, Chris Meckley is all about getting it done. And yes, I am slacking. It is so true. Speaking of slacking, uh, here's something surprising about my tank that I came out of the blue. Did not expect it. My 400 gallon, we'll put it back on the screen again for a second here. Um, it's fine, but I've not had much time to work on it. I've been super swamped with business, business, business. And, you know, I'm doing good to clean the glass. And, you know, I did a big water change uh, recently. Um, I think... I think it was like the 29th of the of December or something. So not long, but um, the what I noticed was I have no antheus. I was like, when did I lose my antheus? And uh, I remember I had the two bimax and they were gorgeous, and I had two liar tail. And then I lost the male, which I thought was a freak accident because he was face first into an acropora colony. And what I was thinking was that he went after some food that got blown into the coral and went straight at it and got wedged because his cheek spines were caught and he was really hard to remove from the colony. I don't think he just blew into it accidentally. I think he wedged himself and died. And I was like, okay, that's crazy. I'm sorry it happened. But I still had the female and I had the liar tails. And then I was like, I have the female and one liar tail. <laughs> and now I have none. I'm like, where are the antheas? When, when did I lose them? And I'm really surprised because nothing else on the tank has changed. I, I still feed the same amount all the time. And, um, you know, all I was doing was not cleaning the glass, <laughs> you know, not taking the turf scrubber out. So I'm not sure what happened. I mean, I know antheists like to be fed a lot, but I've usually my daily feeding is heavy enough that I've never had a surprise uh, loss of antheists. So this was a weird one and I'm kind of bummed out about it. So I got to get some more antheists. Scott Zinn says, uh, my SPS are doing much better since dosing potassium. It is finally about mid-range on the Reef Labs parameters. Oh, that's good. Yeah, the uh, general rule of thumb, according to um, Justin Credible, was that you should have a minimum, minimum of 400 ppm. And I, I think he's right. Uh, I think when your tank is 360, 380, it's still not enough. I think you need to push it up to 400 you can be a little higher, 
Uh, 400, 450, that's a good target range to try and stay inside. I would highly recommend that to everyone. Uh, Plummin says, tell us more about the Skunk Clowns. How is the group doing? They're doing great. They've been with me now, I believe, six or seven years. Uh, I try to do head counts, and last time I checked, I still sat, saw 11. And um, yeah, they go from tiniest to biggest. <laughs> There's still some skirmishes. You'll see them kind of... Uh, fighting for because what happens if two of them are the same size there's a skirmish or they just are like hey you're you're just getting on my nerves today you need to go over there and you'll see one swim away but then they always return and they're always there in that that collective right there near spock they do love the anemones obviously and uh, they find different spots to live but they're great and uh, these were tank raised i got them from an insane ridiculous sale from a fish store here locally and um and they were a really fun video <laughs> that uh, is actually the most popular video on my channel was the adding those skunk clownfish to the tank, to this tank. Fish Ventura, I don't know what to say. Uh, I had someone else on with me testing this all, you know, not during a live stream. And he says, you sound fine. So I don't know if I'm not talking loud enough, but I, I want everyone to be happy. And when I do the playbacks, it seems like it's okay, but maybe it's not. Maybe I just need to go back to the old microphone and, and give up on this really cool one. I like this microphone. It's big. It's right here. I mean, it's a Yeti. It's not some cheap little off-market thing, you know? So. can't. Feel, maybe it just needs to be way closer to me. But uh, I've had it before, like when we were doing Markna and we had two people talking, it picked up both people. It picked up everyone. It picked up Jack making noise. It gets everything. So that's why I've been sticking with it. But if it really is that bad for everyone, then I need to know because obviously I need to correct that. Do any of you still run trickle filters? Please answer in the chat and or in the comments under these, this video. I am very interested to know if trickle filters are still in operation for saltwater aquariums. I know they use them on freshwater, so I'm not asking about that. I just want to know, do you have a saltwater tank? And if so, what kind of tank, you know, what kind of livestock are you keeping that you use a trickle filter for? Please let me know. Uh, Insane Reefer says, I would put the output of the GFO reactor to a filter sock. That is a method, and then I've seen people even have, uh, they'll fill the filter sock with polyfill, uh, which is this white fluffy stuff like you fill pillows with, and that way the output would go into the polyfill and could trap the fines in that, as well as hope the sock catches anything trying to leak out. But really, if you just send it out and into um, a bucket for that 20, 30 minutes and then move it in, you should be good to go. <laughs> John says, I have to double the volume to hear you, but it's a long way to England. You're right. You're right. That's true. Um, Dustin says, would a 300 watt heater support a 150 gallon frag tank? It's a little low, um, like my volume. <laughs> now I'm going to harp on that. Um, usually it's three watts per gallon, but you might find that works. You might say, eh, it's good enough. Um, to be honest, I, I'm not a big fan of big heaters on a system, period. And I would rather have you have two smaller heaters that add up to the number you like. So, I mean, if you own a 300-watt heater and you want to use a 150-gallon, you can. I have three 300-watt uh, heaters on my system, and it's 450 gallons of water. So, it, you're not far off. You know, I mean, you take your 150, 300, 400. Yeah, <laughs> I use three 300-watt heaters. But... If it was me doing your tank, I would probably have two 150 watt heaters or maybe two uh, 200 watt heaters for a 150 gallon tank. I don't need to use a lot of heat on my tank, but I also, I want to mention, I use 900 watts of heat, yes, but huge system. The room temperature is always comfortable to where I can be in a t-shirt. I'm not like bundled up like some people do. They keep the house really cold and uh, they have to wear sweaters all through winter. I mean, you know, yes, I'll throw on a sweater, but... I also have times where I'm just comfortable. You know, I just don't, I don't have to worry about it. Keep the house around 72 all the time and that works. But if this house gets really cold, I have two extra 300 watt heaters I can plug in for emergency additional heat 
to maintain the tank if there's a crunch. And that even uh, pertains to running off of a generator when you've got a crisis and there's no power and my generator is bringing in all this power from outside through a real thick 50 amp uh, feed and then I can actually run as many heaters as I want. And during the ice storm of 2021, I my house was 57 degrees, which was really cold for me and Jack, but the tank stayed 76 the whole time with five 300 watt heaters. All right, advanced aquatic pets, what type of tank? Uh, okay, a mixed reef with tanks and other reef safe fish. And he's running a trickle filter. And you and it sounds like you run a maintenance company. Yeah, you said you maintain a tank. So is the trickle filter beneficial because it's something you visit frequently? Or I'm sorry, it, you know, every couple of weeks or weekly or whatever it is. And so you, there's no benefit to approaching skimmer filter socks. Is this why you've gone? I really want to know why the trickle filter is even being used. Because I always knew that they are great at converting ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate. It, it just goes ammonia, nitrate. <laughs> but then there's no way to remove that. So are you having nitrate issues running a trickle filter? Are these tanks running at a higher nitrate? Because you'd say it's a mixed reef, so we know we want those nitrates to be lower than in a fish-only system. I want more information. I've never even heard of that. Zen Reefer says, don't use the mold-resistant polyfill if you buy it. It has icky chemicals in it. I didn't even know there was mold resistant. I've always seen polyfill and it was like, make your own pillows. And it just was, I didn't know there was different types. So thank you for bringing that up. Ah, she said, uh, I had, I may have bought the wrong one accidentally, wasted money, had to buy more. Yep, I hear that. Okay. Um, What other parts of filtration did we not get into? I didn't talk about live rock. Uh, I didn't talk about uh, deep sand beds. You know, I didn't, you know, these are natural filters. I also did not talk about uh, the refugium itself and how it could be a natural filter as well and how it does because all those things are going to be in coral. <laughs> but they are. I mean, filtration is not just a machine. I mean, there's different ways of filtering water. And I remember, you know, when our club was really, you know, active on the forums, so much has changed over the years. You know, everyone migrates to Facebook and dissipates. And you just don't have that cohesive conversations we used to have back in the day where you would read 10 or 15 build threads about different reef tanks and learn so much from each other. But um, I really enjoyed those threads and people would be showing their systems with all their, their filtration underneath and fine tuning those protein skimmers to be optimum and and uh, getting all these reactors hooked up and UV and ozone and all these different things. And then you'd always have a fish store that says, we have one tank at, right at the front where everyone walks in, doesn't have any filtration whatsoever. We do a weekly water change and it's beautiful. And people are like, that's crazy. You don't have any filters. And they do. It's a natural filtration. It's, it's not using mechanical stuff to do it. And that is another viable route if you're staying on top of it. And Caitlin's Reef is a glass aquarium that has sand and rock, a power head, a heater, an air stone, and nothing else. There's no under gravel filter, there, there's nothing. So eventually I added the Ciche Shark Pro and I put that in there because I was curious if it could make a difference and it did, it polished the water nicely. And all I had inside it were three foam sponges and I'd have to take off the basket once a week and rinse those sponges out. And of course, if I don't stay on top of it, the sponges get really disgusting. It's shocking what it pulls out of the water because there's only two fish in that tank. <laughs> and it's like, wow, it still has so much. And uh, then when I was at Aquashella, I was talking with Melissa, who was in the booth, and she had this little insert that I needed that you flip open a lid and you can fill it with carbon and you put it in the middle of that cube. So now you have two sponges in the carbon, you remove the other. So you don't have three sponges. You have two in a carbon. And the other day I was cleaning all the walls of the tank. I did a water change, the water was murky. I put in my new little basket with my carbon and my sponges. And I was like, let's see how you do. And the next day the tank was like really crystal clear. I was like, wow, that was really impressive. I actually like that little guy. And that's the smallest Shark Pro that they offer. Um, I, I wanted that intentionally because the tank's only, it's a 27 gallon aquarium and it's really holding probably 24 gallons maybe. I've never really done the math, but it's, it's small. And so I just need minimal filtration on that tank, but there's no nothing hanging off the back. There's no uh, 
reactors on there. There's no dosing pumps on there. It is the simplest system ever. And it's been running now for coming up on a year and a half. And I'm not saying it's perfect. <laughs> it is natural for a reason. And uh, I did it in Caitlin's honor. And this is how I feel she would have done it. She would just be cleaning. I know exactly what she'd do. She'd be standing next to the tank right now with her, you know, her water up to her arm as she's sponging the glass and keeping her stuff pretty and arranging her rock work just the way she wanted it. She would want nothing to do with sumps and skimmers and uh, and all these other things. She's like, nope, don't need to do any of that. And look how beautiful it is. And I'm sure it would be beautiful. Myself, I don't really reef like that. So it's more like I ignore it a little bit because I just expect things to be fine. But then I have to get in there and really interact with it and really start doing some cleaning. And right now I've got this brown stuff that's been building up on the surface of the sand and I'm trying out something that Chris Meckley told me last night. That's what led to the whole, aren't you dosing your elements? And uh, I'm going to try it out and see if it works like he suggested because that would be really cool. And if it does, I will tell you guys about it. And if it doesn't, I'll keep my mouth shut. Oh, this is interesting. Salem says he has a phytoplankton reactor and a cryptic sump. Okay, so the cryptic sump, if you guys haven't heard of that, is a sump with no light, very low flow. Usually it's filled with rock. And, you know, Salem, if I've got this incorrect, you know, feel free to add more details in this chat. And it's a cryptic zone full of cool little critters. And it is a form of absolute natural filtration. And I remember learning about this because Steve Tyree did a presentation to DFW Mass. 20 years ago and it was and he talked about this huge sump he had under this one system filled with the frags he would sell and half the sump was cryptic zone and it was really fascinating and he showed us all the things that were in there all the bits of life and i was like man i'm actually intrigued i think i kind of want to do this and he also had it covered to where it had very you know it didn't have light it was the opposite it was dark and um interesting but the phytoplankton reactor the phyto i want to know about that because I, I feel like I've heard about that once or twice, but never delved into it. And you say it's for the win. So I need to know more. So get a hold of me or, or tell me more in here. Insane Reefer <laughs> asks, always ask the important questions. Any update on the anemone tank? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And shockingly, I was looking at some older pictures on my phone. The stand that I built for that aquarium was built in July 2023 and hasn't been completed. Shocking. Uh, just because I don't make the time to get on the road, go to a lumber yard, get the last bits of stuff I need to finish this project. And it's definitely on my, my hit list of things to get done ASAP. And it was what I talked about last week. Things I want to knock out in 2024 and getting that tank operational is top of my list. Because that will not only get them back in full view where you guys can enjoy them, It'll be fun to have a couple more new videos about the install. It will also allow me to get to the algae turf scrubber so I can clean it every 10 days like I should be. So there's all these per and getting some free space in the fish room behind the tank that I right now I don't have and can't even install the walk board to work on the tank because that temporary thing is in my way. So, you know, I thank you for pestering me about this. I am pestering myself as well. I, I don't ignore it. There's only so many. I mean, yesterday... I'm pretty sure I worked 30 hours in a 24-hour day. <laughs> it's just been a lot going on. And I was just putting out fires yesterday and uh, doing everything I could do to make it through the day. And Matt Peterson was telling me last night at 2 in the morning, go to bed, sleep. So I did. <laughs> Can you believe it? He was talking to me at 2 a.m. Do you guys talk to your friends at 2 a.m. about aquarium stuff? Dustin says, technically, if you had the right ratio of corals to fish, wouldn't the corals and the live rock keep your nutrients in a good range? Uh, that's actually a great question. It's a good one to ponder on. And when you think about it, is it the corals to fish ratio or is it the fish bio load that really is the dominating thing? Because putting corals in a tank doesn't typically, it's not considered a bio load we can have a tank filled with corals and have really low nutrients because we're not putting much food in. But the more fish you have and the more you feed the fish, the more nutrients you're going to add to the system. Now, 
there are corals that are going to be more hungry, like an SPS system is going to be uh, low nutrient, where a non-photosynthetic tank or a seahorse tank, uh, you know, filled with gorgonians, you're going to feed the crap out of it because these li- these pieces of livestock can only feed off food. They don't feed off of light. And because of it, you're adding so much food to the system all the time, you absolutely have to have mechanical and even frequent big water changes to keep things under control. So can corals and the rock work balance out the nutrient load? The corals, not so much. The live rock, if it is live rock, could. I don't feel like dry rock can until it's really, really become mature. And by mature, a minimum of in a tank that's been running for a year or longer. You can just tell the difference between that stuff you put in your tank when you first set it up and how it just was holding things up. It's literally what I would, I mean, I know it is, it's a structure, but it could fit under the category of decor. You know, it's not doing anything physical for the tank. And then as it gets populated with bacteria, as it it matures, as it gets covered in things, life that sneak in on your frag plugs and uh, or even things you plant or critters you add or cleanup crew you add that had things on their shell those kind of things get into the system and your rock work will start to become more beneficial but dry rock becoming beneficial takes a super long time where live rock is beneficial from day one basically and uh, it helps denitrify it's a it's been an ongoing thing we've known for a super long time and we just got away from it. Uh, I can tell you back in the day, we would get only live rock and it would cost us a small fortune to fill our tank with rock and everyone complained about it. Like, it's so expensive. You know, $8 a pound, $9 a pound, it adds up. And it was heavy because it was in salt water and they would take it out of the salt water, this soaking wet rock, stick it on a scale and say, that's $11, that's $88 for this one rock. How many do you want? And you're like, one. <laughs> I can't get more than that. And, you know, we would be buying cases of rock, 45 pounds at a time, and it'd be six or $800 or whatever it was. And you're like, oh my God. And you'd fill your tank up and you could immediately add your livestock. You could put in your fish and it just did so well. Now, when people are setting up tanks with dry rock, they have to go in more slowly because you have to let everything get established and get things uh, uh, stabilized. Uh, some people are pre-soaking their dry rock because of the phosphate coming out of the new rock because it's so high you know after it's been it's been taken from the earth it's been uh cleaned up before it ever went to you and it's super light and it costs so little in comparison people like that's why i want it and so back in the day when everyone was buying live rock people were trying to avoid that cost and they'd say i'm just going to buy 50 percent of the rock live rock and i'm going to spend i'm going to buy base rock because it's way cheaper i'm going to put base rock on the bottom and live rock on top and that way I get the benefits and the prettiness of live rock and all that base rock is the stuff I would never see and I'm saving all this money. And it then graduated it, or it uh, gradually shifted from some base rock to how about if I fill the tank with lots of base rock and put in one piece of live rock, will it then migrate across and get on all of it? And you could see those people with those tanks were always struggling they weren't keeping up with the guys that just start other tanks with, you know, and, and just ran them with live rock. And so that was a thing. And then, you know, Marco Rock came on the scene and was selling uh, their dry rock like crazy. And uh, and people were like, oh, look, I can get all this rock for like $2 a pound. It's such a deal. I filled my tank for under 100 bucks, or I, I don't even know how much. It was nothing. And like, you guys spent way too much money. Ha ha, you guys are idiots. <laughs> like, no, no, we're not idiots. You need to go very slowly and be more patient than we do because you're using barren rock. And uh, that's still true to this day. I mean, most of you guys these days are only buying dry rock. You're not even looking for the live rock. And, you know, live rock is still valid. It's still available from four or five companies. It's, uh, it can do something good for you. But if you want to do a 50-50 to save money and use some dry rock and some live rock, you can. But don't fear the live rock. It's a good thing. It's got all kinds of good benefits that help your system. Uh, Triggerfish says, I didn't hear you mention the current big thing, the roller mats. Well, the roller mats are like the fleece rollers. You know, I did talk about that briefly. I was explaining it somewhat. And uh, there are different styles in the market. There's this one company whose name likes to elude me all the time, Royal Exclusive. And they make these huge sums called the Dream Box. 
and they're made of white, uh, probably PVC, I think, or ABS. And they have these clear windows in each compartment on the front. And it's so sexy. It's just beautiful. And um, they would make one huge section of it the fleece roller system, the roller mat. And it's a giant roll of this uh, this material that is probably, I don't know, you can probably pick the micron. It might be 200 micron, it might be 100 micron, it might be 80 micron. Obviously, the smaller the micron, the more quickly it's going to clog and the more rapidly it will advance the roll and use it all up. But it looks great. <laughs> I cannot, you know, put it down in any form or fashion. But it is something that you will be maintaining. Just like you're keeping a protein skimmer running, you're going to be keeping up with that roller mat to make sure that the, the roll has not run out or that it needs to be replaced. And it's, it's going to be an ongoing thing you have to do. Just like cleaning out an algae turf scrubber every 10 days. When you don't, it doesn't go well. I, I know that personally. Smeds Pet says, I feed my copper band a lot. I finally tested phosphates for fun. I like that. Phosphates for fun. And it was at 4.0. <laughs> Time for Phosphate Rx. Yeah, I'd say so. 4.0, that's really high. So listen, um, I learned from Randy Holmes Farley a long, long time ago because I was having a big phosphate problem in my 280 gallon that if your phosphates get over 3.0, which is insanely high, that that is the point where your tank is actually going to absorb the phosphate into the rock work and into the sand bed. And then when you treat the tank with GFO or phosphate RX is the way to go, by the way, I'm just going to tell you because I did GFO for nine months and could not get the phosphate out of my system. My tank was 3.0. I was like, Oh no, I've hit that spot that Randy warned me about. I was like, I can't believe it. But I was putting in two sheets of Nori a day. I was feeding six tangs and I was just making sure they were getting all the food they needed and I thought my filtration would keep up, and it was not keeping up with the phosphate. And I went through different brands of GFO, trying, you know, maybe Roafos is better, maybe Tunzi Silfos is better. Uh, there was this cheap one off eBay I tried out. There, I mean, I went through like five brands of different GFOs, and nothing was working for me. And then I found a product that uh, was called Fosbuster Pro, which I used for a while, and it was fine. And then Phosphate Control came out which then later be, was renamed Phosphate RX, and the rest is history. I've been using it forever. But just so you know, your tank is at 4.0, so when you put in uh, Phosphate RX, it will, you know, whatever, you know, don't overdo it. You know, take your time. We don't need to get it from 4.0 to 0.04. Um, but if you were to put in three drops per 10 gallons in your tank, <clears throat> it will bring the phosphate down. Maybe it'll bring it down to 3.5, 3.2, something like that. <clears throat> And then you do it again, and you do it again. You know, like every couple of days, put in a little bit of phosphate RX, and it'll bring it down. <clears throat> However, because you... Man, I hate it when you just know it's still back there. Okay, throat, work. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> then if it exceeded 3.0, like you said it did, what can happen is it will continue to leach out of the rock. So while you're expecting it to trend down all the time, you might see it elevate again, and it's because it came out of the rock. And it came out of the rock again, and comes out of the rock again. And you just keep doing it, and you stay on your schedule of dosing phosphate or X every few days. And that way you will get it out of the system. <coughs> Jeez, what is back there? Insane Reefer says, I've been experimenting with Tropic Marin carbon dosing, and I can say it works great, and I'm not trying to put a plug for them, but it's working for me, and I'm not sponsored. <laughs> Neither am I, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So carbon dosing, what are you talking about? What specifically? Are you talking about a liquid like vodka dosing, and it's just the, their thing, or is, is it some kind of a media? What is it? Because I'm not aware of all the products Tropic Marin has. Matter of fact, let me look at the back of my magazine. All for Reef, K Elements, Biomagnesium, Carbocalcium. Yeah, I don't see, is that what you're using, Carbocalcium? It says concentration, concentrated calcium and alkaline in one solution, the pH and salinity of the system remain unchanged. 
I think you're talking about something else. I want to know what you're talking about. Lincoln Town says, I was getting green slime because my nitrates and phosphates were out of whack, and I added a couple more fish, and everything balanced out nicely. So that's my theory. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really finish uh, addressing that comment earlier, but there is an equilibrium you can attain with a tank. It can get to that balance point, but then as soon as you introduce something new, it could push it past its limit, and now things start to get more complicated. And so having... A certain amount of coral in the tank and a certain amount of fish like a long time ago my tank was doing great it was beautiful i was proud i was showing it to my father and he said but where are all the fish I'm like what are you talking about they're right there 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 and he said there's not a lot of fish there should be he says it's like you're decorating it with a few and i just nodded at him like yeah that's exactly what i did because <laughs> i'm a coral guy i love the corals fish are hard and you can't frag them but you can definitely have corals Uh, Dustin says, do you think the ratio of phosphate to nitrate can have an effect on coral growth? Yes, there are limiting factors when phosphate gets too high and nitrate gets too high, and it can actually stunt the growth of corals or even stop them or even kill them. Um, and it, it just depends how gradually the numbers shifted. For example, I had a really beautiful acropora that I got from a guy in, um, I think the town was called Crowley, which is south of Fort Worth a little bit. And it was a green Acropora nobilis, I think, or Abrolhensis. I think that's what it was, Abrolhensis. Beautiful, beautiful coral. But the thing was, he had this giant colony in his tank when I was visiting. I was like, that is amazing. You grew that? I mean, it was just, it looked like a giant Gorgonian colony, right? And he's like, yeah, you want a frag? I'm like, yes. And he gave me this big branch. I mean, I came home with it in a five-gallon bucket. You couldn't even put it in a bag, if I remember correctly. It seems right. But anyway, it was a brown colony with these bright blue tips. And I was like, I love it. And I came home with it. And it was a tank with only metal halides. And I probably dipped it. <laughs> and then I put it in my reef. Completely different look. Still gorgeous. It was the best coral ever. It was green with blue tips. And it was fantastic. And then every once in a while, I would literally lose one whole branch. A whole branch would just turn white and die. And then, you know, fast forward a few weeks, and then a branch would die. It's like, ah, oh, why am I losing? It's really an awesome coral. I can't afford these losses. So I'd start to frag it and start giving pieces to other people. I said, can you put this in your tank? So in case I lose this, you've got a, you know, I have a backup I can turn to you. And they're like, sure, sure. And then, you know, I get a hold of them and says, so how's it doing? It's like, it died immediately. I'm like, oh. and it's like, so I'm the only one that can keep this alive. And even I'm not doing it long term. I'm, 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 I'm losing, you know, inches at a time. It's terrible. And I must have given out pieces to eight different people and everyone killed it. I'm like, ah, oh. and eventually, you know, but what I found out and coming back to your question, Dustin um, I found out my nitrates were crazy high. I had like a test kit that was giving me false readings. And that's why that coral was so miserable. <laughs> it would be okay. It was hanging in there. But then one branch, like, I can't take it, die. And then, you know, after a while, another branch, like, eh, die. And I was like, that was what was happening. And so I got those nitrates down and I was able to enjoy the coral. However, I think the reason it died in everyone else's tank is because everyone else had good water quality where mine was really high and my coral was enduring it and tolerating it and putting up with it but even the the hardiest of corals at some point will just hit that tipping point like too much too long bye bye and you lose them so we don't want to have higher numbers and say it's fine it's fine because number one you might not be able to share your corals with others because the systems are so different that the coral just commits suicide basically in the new better water which is kind of ironic uh, you know, when Dwayne brings me stuff, I always think his water's so fantastic, and I always feel guilty because I know my water's not, and I always expect, you know, half of what he hands is just going to drop dead. Well, it doesn't. It's amazing. The stuff just lives, and I'm like, wow. And it seems to be that his uh, water might not be quite as fantastic as I think it is. <laughs> because maybe, maybe we reef so similarly that even though he's in Seattle and I'm in, you know, in Texas, in Fort Worth here, that it, we're fine. 
But yeah, you do want to make sure you have them somewhere. So anyway, I would, you know, just to sum this up, I would say nitrates should be 20 ppm or low, lower. You know, I know some companies will say 10 or less. And, you know, originally it was always like three is the goal. But under 20 works for most corals you could possibly buy. And then phosphate, under 0.1 is fine. 0 0.03 might be the magic goal and what matches the ocean, but really anything under 0.1 is really solid. And a lot of times people have phosphates a little higher, like they might be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. My reef tends to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.75 at any time during the year. And it just comes down to where you're at. <laughs> the Zen Ginger is giving advice that I cannot possibly follow. She says, eating a banana can help the scratchy throat if you have one to continue talking for some reason. Although I wouldn't suggest that on camera on the interwebs. That's hilarious. Yeah, that would not be good. I'd have to switch to a logo from a company. You know, just stick something on the screen that uh, would be better. All right. Oh, you know what? I didn't do... I should have jumped to this a long time ago because we are kind of doing this. So here we're on a different camera. And uh, we got the Fritz logo up there because Fritz is a sponsor of this channel. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Insane Reefer says he's using Bacto Balance. Isn't that the thing I mentioned? No. And that's not on here. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to learn about that. I'll find, I'll check, I'll get with Lou. I got to hear about this stuff. Uh, John Wright says, when adding any chemicals, you need to know how much water is in your tank and not go by what the manufacturer classifies it. Uh, so many people don't know how much water uh, they added to their tank. That's true, and uh, it's really smart if you can go ahead and determine how much water you're adding in the first place, or when you're doing water changes, determine it by how much you're taking out. It's like, for example, let's say your tank is full of water and you drain down this much. <laughs> you come down, I don't know, four or five inches, and that adds up to what? Three five-gallon buckets, so 15 gallons of water. Then you know this much is 15 gallons, so then you can go to the rest of the tank and go 15, 30, 45, you know, 60. And you can kind of get a, an eyeball number of what really is probably in your tank. Now, mathematically, you can measure the inside dimensions of your tank, not the outside. It's real important not to measure the outside dimensions of the tank and or the trim of the aquarium because there's no water on the outside of the tank. There's no water where the glass or the acrylic is. There's no water where the base is lifted up. There's no water where there's trim on the top. You know, there's none. It's only the actual water in the tank. So if you were to take a tape measure and say, okay, well, my tank is 30 inches, but from the top of the sand to here is really 24 inches. <laughs> so you got 24 inches of water, and then you can take the length times width times height. So let's, my tank is 84 inches long, but my glass is three quarters of an inch thick. So that puts my tank at 82 and a half inches long inside and my tank is 36 inches wide but that makes it 34 and a half inches internally so i take 82 and a half times 34.5 times that 24 inch height equals divided by 231 and that says 295 gallons and that would be literally just looking at water and not counting the other four inches of sand. Now the sand is displacing some of the water, but it is an, it's still part of the equation. And so you could take the inches and still figure it out. Or you can do this. You could say, well, how much is one inch of water in my aquarium? So let's say your tank is 48 inches long and let's say the tank is half inch glass. So we'll say 47 inches long by, and the tank is 18. So we'll say it's 17 wide times one inch divided by 231, one inch would be 3.45 gallons. And then you could say, well, how many inches of water do I see? And that, that's how you can figure out the water volume in your tank, for example. And, you know, there's lots of ways of doing this. I mean, you could literally drain all the water out into containers and then as you're putting it in, keep track. Um, but yes, you can mathematically determine it. And I know that my 400 gallon is not true 400. That's why my 400 gallon, including all plumbing, including the sump, 
including the anemone cube, is still only 450 gallons liquid volume. Because the anemone cube is 60 gallons, the refugium, I'm sorry, the sump itself holds to the top around 145 gallons, but it runs somewhere around 80, I think. So I've got 80 gallons in the sump. I've got, let's say, 45, 50 gallons in the anemone cube. And then you've got the water in the reef tank. That's why I say my water volume is 450. I'm not saying 450 plus a 60 gallon tank, so that puts me at 460, and 150 gallon sump, that puts me at five, you know, whatever. I mean, like, I'm not doing that because that would be incorrect and I would be overdosing my products, and that's really important not to do. Um, if I were to just use all those outside dimensions, I would be telling you, oh, I have a 610 gallon system. You're like, wow! I'm like, no, I only have 450. <laughs> so when I'm dosing anything, I want to know how much water I have. So, like, for example, phosphate or X. If I want to dose three drops per 10 gallons, and I know my liquid water volume is 450, 450 divided by 10 is going to be 45, times three drops, I need to put in 135 drops. If I wanted to use the full dose that Phosphate RX, Phosphate RX recommends, they would say six drops per 10 gallons, and that would be 45 times six. I need to put in 270 drops to lower phosphates. But that number would be uh, full strength, and potentially could be risky to the livestock. So I always do it at half strength. And I've been doing it like that for years. And I typically put in 125 to 135 drops. There have been times I've put in 220 to 250 drops, just like, boom, doing it, let's see what happens. But uh, nothing bad happened. But uh, that's just an example. Now, when you're dosing trace elements or you're gonna do vodka dosing, you need to know exactly what your water volume is so you do not overdose and put in too much. If you're using no pox, you don't want to put in too much because it can cause all kinds of issues in your tank, especially a big, huge slime buildup that goes everywhere and things can bleach out. If you think your water volume is huge, like I said, 610 gallons because of a lie that I told myself, and I put in enough GFO for 610, I would see corals struggling. So I need to know true water volume. And so, yes, John, you're absolutely right. You want to know those things before you put anything in. Um, you know, that is so weird. Radar says you must have turned your back to the Red River now because your microphone is perfect. The microphone is still there. I'm just looking at this camera. And if I look at this camera, I mean, I don't see how audio changes because it still says it's using the Yeti mic. It's not using some other microphone. I literally don't understand how that changes from one camera to another because the cameras are just the video. The audio is the microphone. So maybe I shouldn't face the mic. Maybe the mic should not be in front of me, which is weird. I do know when I first did it, I would point it at me and Ian says, no, 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 you've got to have it uh, straight up and down in front of you because it's that kind of mic. And, and he showed the instructions and literally he was right. It, it talks about bringing the audio correctly. I don't know. I, it's the most confusing thing ever. And John says, really, the only way to know for sure is to measure how much you're putting in. Yeah, if you want to do that, and, you know, this is a good idea. Like, for example, let's say you wanted to make a trash can worth of salt water, and you want to know how much salt you are going to use every time from now on. Then you would take a five-gallon bucket or a one-gallon jug or whatever it is as a measuring tool, and you keep putting those in. And you can mark the lines on the trash can at five gallons, 10 gallons, 15 gallons, 20 gallons, all the way up. And then you'll know I'm my trash can, like for example, those typical trash cans people would use in the past were 33 gallon trash cans. And they could only hold about 30 gallons of water because you can't go to the absolute top of the trash can. And then you need to know how much salt you're gonna use. And normally it's a half a cup of salt per gallon, but then you put in that much with your 30 gallons, so you put in 15 cups of salt, and salinity was like 1.021, 1.022. You're like, no, I want 1.026. So you go ahead and you add in another cup and a half, and you're like, okay, so I need 16 and a half cups for this 30 gallons of water. Now I know forever. You make a note, and it makes it easier for mixing batches. But if you just said, this is a 33 gallon trash can, and you never actually put the, the demarcations on the side, you didn't know how much water you had in there, and you're just adding salt, it, it's this guesswork thing. It, it's You're being less scientific and you're, you're, you're operating off of hopes and dreams and trying to get it right. And it shouldn't be a riddle. It should be something you can emulate time after time for consistency's reasons. Okay. 
Um, Fishman Link says the water volume for 82 by 34 by 24 is approximately 289.66 gallons. I'd call that 290 and weighs 2,415.78 pounds. It's always nice to know how much your tank, your water weighs. Triggerfish says your audio has sounded the same the whole chat and it's been good. If I can hear you while driving a mail truck, they can figure it out. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe I'll just stop worrying about it. Okay, what else? What else can we talk about today? And do you guys have any more questions? I appreciate your feedback on the... Um... Oh, we got to wrap this up. I got to do a phone call. <laughs> it's four o'clock. Uh, let me jump onto this really, really fast. There we go. Uh, I want to remind you guys, as I said earlier, I'm just going to reiterate it. Today is water test Saturday, and we are, and um, we need to check our tank's parameters. Now, we kind of delved into that a little bit already, but please do test your tank. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to remind you every single week. I am your reminder, okay? Just, that's it. I am your, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Somehow, my I was going to say, I'm your bookmark, and but that doesn't really work. But I want you to test your water so you know what the quality is. I'm going to be checking my tanks today. I want to know what they are because I want to see where I'm at, especially with an ICP test coming up in the future. It'd be kind of nice to kind of know where I was and where I'm going to be. And that way, when they send my results back, I can kind of look at the, the trending for the last two weeks. And it's really important to do so. And if you do it, you can track it in something like Reef Trace. It's a great app. Um, for a little while there, it was unavailable, and it is back in the App Store on for iPhone. It's probably, probably been an Android the whole time with no issue. And so if you're needing a way to track your parameters, you can. Also, uh, it also lets you keep notes of all the things you do in your tank, which the notes section is probably my favorite part because it lets me see when I do things. I actually like it because I'll take a picture of something that I'm doing and you'll see a visual, a title, and the description of what I did. And so if I can't remember when I did it last, I look through the photos and I can just quickly say, oh, there it is right there. That's when I changed the tubing of my Versa pump or whatever. And if you're doing all these things, then your livestock will be happy and healthy. And I wish you guys the best weekend. And I will see you again next Saturday. Bye, guys.